the gospel that I heard bits and pieces my whole life and precisely, more specifically, that trip, the it all started coming together. All the pieces started coming together. But again, I, I didn't really see that it was me that needed to be saved. I grew up in a Pentecostal church all the way to from the time I can remember till I was about 16 years old. And um, my memory of this Pentecostal church uh, was that it was very dry for me. It was very boring and I dreaded every moment that I was there. I didn't understand what was being said. Um, and so I remember vaguely when I was as young as I can remember um, doing anything I could to postpone arriving church so I could be there even five, ten minutes uh, less than I would have. And so I remember the times that I was there, um, very often I would just uh, lay down in the pews and, and go to sleep. <laughs> that was a very regular occurrence for me. As time went by, um, my mother, uh, realizing that me and my two younger sisters didn't have a whole lot of friends, there wasn't a whole lot of youth, there was a lot of older people in that congregation, <clears throat> and so she uh, was concerned in her mind that we were going to quote unquote go off into the world. She decided to go to different churches that had more programs and more youth and kind of keep us entertained and keep us going to church even after we became of age. I, I believe that was her idea and her thought um, behind going to different churches. So we did that. And um, at, during that, that time, all the way until I was in high school, so this was around 16, 17 years old, during that time, um, I looked like an average kid on the outside, um, externally somewhat clean, you can say, um, you know, involved in sports to some degree and, and didn't do drugs. And, and so I, I believe that um, in, in this... Um, environment that we were brought up in that was highly praised and looked upon as long as you looked externally clean and um and so it was it was a very uh having that title of christian was something that was definitely take it for granted um just just a, a label or a title due to my parents raising us up in that environment so that was the atmosphere the environment that we were a part of so from that point, um, and the different churches that I was a part of um, as a kid, unconverted, um, I, uh, at the same time, while being more involved in, in these churches that had more programs and more activities and more fun things going on to keep us entertained, at the same time in school, I was involved in more externally wicked things, which was more obvious and visible. And so at that point, my mother did start becoming alarmed and concerned. Whereas if I had just been a clean kid, not doing and not being involved in those things, but just being involved in sports and the other things that don't look as obviously wicked, um, I think she would have been okay with that and, and never uh, panicked. But she did start panicking um, and thinking that I was, she was going to, again, quote unquote, lose me to the world. So um, as time progressed and I, I started becoming involved with rap music and me and my close friends, um, we were just very much so involved and enwrapped in the, the rap music. <laughs> and so... Um, in time, I started not only rapping, but seeking to live out what I was rapping about. And uh, of course, I didn't, I, I didn't get to live out all the things that I was um, rapping about, but I, I sought to live out as much as I was able to or could do, um, which were very wicked things. So in time, again, my, my mother not seeing everything I was involved with, but enough to know that um, I was no longer externally clean from her perspective um, and to her standards. So she got desperate and 
um, was able to orchestrate uh, a missionary trip with the church we were at at that time um, to Argentina. And so at that point, um, I sought to do everything in my power to not go. Um, I talked to the coordinator and just said, look, um, I'm working, I'm, I'm busy, I have to do these things so I can't go. Um, that was my excuse because I, I wanted to continue. My, my God, my center of my life was doing rap music and that's what I, that's what I was involved with, that's what I wanted to do. And so I, um, I let her know that and she responded by saying um, that if I don't go, the church can sue me because we had already made an agreement. So I don't know how true that was, if she was just making it up. Um, but either way, it did put a little bit of fear and a little bit of conviction in me. And at that moment, I started realizing how much I was putting my parents through. And there was a small thought of that I was ultimately doing that to God. And even though my parents were pursuing me and trying to steer me in the right direction, I, I started having some thoughts that it was ac actually ultimately God uh, pursuing me, but I was suppressing those thoughts and I suppressed that conviction and just went on with uh, being submitted to the fact that I was probably going to have to go on this trip. But before I totally submitted, I did try to pull off one last thing. I tried to fail um, high school in order that I would do summer school. I would have to do summer school. So um, I tried to fail all my classes. So if I knew that the answer was B, I would put C on the test. And I started uh, skipping more than I would uh, normally skip um, in my classes so that, I would be, uh, so that I would flunk. But every single teacher passed me. So at that point, I realized that I had to go. So I packed up my bags um, probably days before I knew I was going to go um, because I tried everything in my power to not go. Um, so went to Argentina, that's where it was in 2006, the summer of 2006, right after I graduated high school. And I went in with uh, my rap music, my, my, my God in my music. And, uh, and so I would secretly listen to it um, while we were uh, doing whatever we were doing at this, um, it was a Bible Institute. And so we had the dorms and, and everything else. And so um, we would very regularly, while I was there about six or seven weeks, go to the slums of the, the, the outskirt towns um, of the area we were at. And it was, it was very, very much so um, impoverished areas, neighborhoods. And we would go over there with the gospel and um, seek to you know, build uh, buildings and, and different things to, to help their needs. Um, but I went with a man who was very diligently explaining the gospel um, uh, in such a way that I've never heard it put in, that, in the way that he explained. Um, God, uh, the holiness of God, man and our depravity and our need for, for him, um, the, the separation between man and God because of our sin. And he labored long and hard um, over the first point, which we use the cube, and the first point was God separated uh, man separated from God because of our sins. So he, he just went in deep with explaining the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. And I remember that hitting me hard. And, um, and I remember thinking that, you know, this was, this was true. Even though I've never heard, I might have heard bits and pieces, but never put the way that this man explained it. So that did stick with me. But again, I, I didn't really see that it was me that needed to be saved. Um, I just still held on to my profession and that title of being a Christian. And I just thought that's, that's nice. And um, so, so I moved on, uh, went on in my, in my days and the weeks I was there. And well, one day, maybe about halfway uh, in my trip there, I overslept. And I, I didn't go with everybody to um, this neighborhood. And one of the pastors 
came by and he said, hey, I'll, I'll take you. Now, this was like about an hour and a half away. So I said, no, 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 I'll go tomorrow. It's fine. And he insisted. And so I got in his car and in that car ride, again, this was in 2006, so it's been a while. I don't remember everything, but I remember he basically was evangelizing to me. He was witnessing to me, preaching the gospel to me, and I was very confused because I had never in my life had anyone be so direct and, and, and expressing the gospel to me as though I needed to hear this, as though I was in danger, as though I needed to be saved. And I, that was so foreign to me. It was so foreign, that concept, that thought. And so I started getting offended. And, and my pride started um, telling him how much basically I didn't need the gospel, how good I was. And so I remember telling him, I go to church every single Sunday since, since I can remember, every Sunday and during the week. And again, like I said before, um, I went out of obligation. <laughs> I didn't go because I wanted to, but I didn't tell him that. I just told him that I went every Sunday and then he asked me this question. I remember, I remember him asking this question precisely. He said, but how do you know based on the Bible that you're a Christian and that's when it really hit me because I realized I never read the Bible. I never read the Bible. I don't know what the Bible says. I couldn't tell you anything about the hardly anything. I mean, I remember certain Bible verses that we memorized, but I never read the Bible. So I remember he started going on and on about sin and and different things. I, th I think he was explaining ways that you know that you're a slave to sin and it was just all hitting me. But at the same time, that's the one uh, question that he asked me that really stuck with me. So later on, I went into the, to the dorms where we were staying and I started reading. I remember I was in um, first and second Corinthians and everything just started jumping out on the page. And, and, and I feel like the gospel that I heard bits and pieces my whole life and precisely more specifically that trip the, the the last few weeks before that it all started coming together all the pieces started coming together and i remember because there were people around i went into the bathroom to try to be secluded and just pouring myself out and i remember one of the things that i i cried out to the lord and i said God, I need you to save me, not just from the penalty of my sin, but from the bondage of my sin. Because the reason I pray that was because there were times in my life when I went to these different churches where they had, uh, they would call it encounters and, and different things. And they would hit, they would talk about sin and they would talk about hell. And I would be terrified and say, you know, I'm, I'm involved in sexual morality. I'm involved. I'm a, I'm a liar. I listen to this bad music. I need to stop doing these things. And I attempted with all my strength and energy to stop doing these things. And, uh, and only to realize that I couldn't, I was enslaved and I loved it. And so I remember that point. And so that had happened several times in my life as a teenager, 13, 15, 16 years old, I would, I would have these encounters, encounters at these places, um, supposedly encountering God, but really I just, <laughs> I just realized that I was enslaved to sin. And so at that point in time, I cried out, God, I need you to f save me. And I, I, and I remember picturing Christ taking on sin upon himself so that I could be saved. And I realized he has the power not just to save me from the penalty of my sin, but from the bondage of my sin. And I remember right then and there, I walked out and I just remember everything was brand new. That passage in, in scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 couldn't have been more real than at that point in my life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. And everything that I, every, all my friends, everything that I, that I saw around me, everything was like a whole different perspective. I saw it with a whole different lens and I saw it as a new man. And that music that I had, quickly I let it go. I was content with never listening to rap again. Although uh, God did bring in good, solid Christian rap that actually helped me in my understanding of scripture. But the point is that I surrendered everything to him at that point. And, and God has been faithful. God is faithful. And, uh, 
And from that point on, um, I was a new man. All my relationships changed. Uh, my life uh, just turned on its head. And uh, by the grace of God, like Paul said, I am what I am. It's all by His grace. And I just give Him all the thanks and the glory for, for saving me, for transforming me, and making me the man I am today. I just also want to mention um, just the reality of me going as a missionary to, to a South America and how easy it could have been for any one of us to go um, on a missionary trip and yet being far from God, not knowing Him, holding a Bible, even going uh, witnessing like I did and not knowing God. And the scripture says um, in Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And so this gospel that we, many of you, have heard and, uh, and understood bits and pieces, but really, the gospel is the power, God's power, that unleashes through His gospel the power, His power unto salvation. So you can and will be saved by His power if the, the contention is, the, the dependence is, if you believe in this gospel, you must, you yourself, trust, embrace, and believe His good news that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, the per, His person and work, who He is, and what He did for mankind to save us from our sin. So, Jesus Christ, He proved that He was God in the flesh, that He defeated death, and that He paid sin's debt by resurrecting after three days. And now through believing, trusting, embracing this gospel, we can and will be saved. And it is His power that not just, in my example, broke the chains of slavery to sin, but does so with every single person who comes to Him in simple faith and trust in His person and in His work. And so I invite you to trust Jesus today.